Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to this month's Enrichment Series webinar. I'm your host, Amir Ganad, and I'm here together with a few folks from Symphony Advisors who are going to talk to us about lessons that they've learned from a global startup. Great, thank you, Amir. A little bit about Symphony. You understand we're a management consulting firm. We're very focused on, from ex on experience uh, versus uh, the typical management consulting firm. Uh, we're broadly based, but you could say we're focused in back office improvement, uh, covering finance, accounting, uh, strategy, supply chain, procurement, uh, and like and like uh, disciplines in the comp in the companies that we serve. So the reason uh, that we are going to talk today is a little bit. I'm glad to hear that uh, about half the people participating are, are owners and entrepreneurs. Uh, we want to bring the perspective of owners and entrepreneurs uh, forward to talk a little bit about the lessons that we've learned trying to grow uh, a firm globally and keep that startup mentality as you start to grow business broadly and you can't keep your fingers on everything. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about the lessons. We've called it twists, turns, and side trips. Uh, it's uh, as you as you as entrepreneurs will know, uh, it's sometimes hard to keep the vision in front of you, uh, and it's often a challenge to try to stay on track as you try to build your business. We want to share some of the experiences. We've had a very interesting year. Uh, as uh, Amir noted, uh, we joined the Inc. 5000 this year, and we went global. We have uh, opened offices in Latin America, uh, Singapore, now in Dubai. And we're in the process of looking at partners to open offices in other parts of the world as well. So we've had an exciting year, and I want to bring our panelists in. So Amir, if you want to move the slide forward. Uh, I'm joined today by Jeff Wiest, who's our CEO and founding partner. Uh, he started Symphony Advisors uh, on the idea of building a practice to help companies develop their financial planning and analysis capabilities. He started that in 2014 based on, as we like to say, a cocktail napkin uh, from years before. Uh, and uh, he retired from P&G in 2015 after 25 years in finance and accounting. Also a founding partner is Graham Cater. He's now our managing partner in Latin America. He's located in Panama. He retired from P&G at the end of 2018 after 33 years in finance and accounting and decided he couldn't leave. He had to go right back to work. So the next morning he started our office in Panama. Bavesh Shah is joining us from Singapore. Uh, we just opened an office this summer in Singapore and Bavesh is one of the managing partners there. He actually left P&G in 2010 after 19 years in product supply uh, and uh, then spent the interim uh, as pro chief procurement officer at Permanich. And then you're hearing me, Nat Brooks. So, Without further ado, we might as well get into the discussion here. And so, as I said before, Symphony had a pretty exciting 2019. We've opened new offices and we debuted on the Inc. 5000 at uh, the rank of 347. So we're pretty proud of ourselves. But what is it? what did it take to achieve this? So I'm gonna open it up. I'll ask Jeff to jump in here and start with this question. But what do you think have been the keys to our, uh, to our success? And, uh, and, and how did we get here? And Nat, thank you very, very much, and, and Amir for, for the wonderful introduction, and uh, and thank you everybody for joining the call this morning. This is a it, it's exciting to be able to share some of the things we've learned uh, over the past five years, and so thank you. I'm uh, always excited to 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 meet and be a part of the the PNG alumni organization. And if I if I kind of step back and and think about you know what were some of those kind of critical keys to our success, I and I kind of lay out maybe four or five different ones. And, and the first one really starts with core values. Um, from the beginning of Symphony, from, you know, obviously all of our times at Procter & Gamble and the PVPs, you know, we wanted to start out our company built around something that we felt represented the work we're doing and the things we're doing. So early on in our, you know, probably almost going back to not quite day one, but very soon, you know, weeks within starting up, you know, we sat down and really talked about what do we find as core values and what do we find as important as we all came together and started working together within Symphony. And, and we kind of landed on seven core values, which essentially have remained the same ever since then. And 
and you know, you those core values, you know, you talk about them. You know, we do every quarter a meeting where we get all of our organization together and we talk about, you know, kind of how the business is doing and we bring up our core values, we talk about them. But I was reminded I was at the Inc. 5000 conference a couple of weeks ago in Phoenix. And as I talked to other entrepreneurs and I talked to other companies who had made it to the list of, you know, the fastest growing companies in the U.S., it was it was amazing to see the number of the highly, highly successful, the you know, the ones that were in the top 500, how many of them. One of the things and the, the, the most important thing they brought out was about the core values and the things they had done to kind of build their company. Uh, so core values is a critical one. The people themselves, um, you know, in a, a management consulting, a consulting business with, you know, we call it advising, you know, it's all about the people. And so being able to find that right organization, the right um, people who, you know, kind of want to come together, want to join that journey, want to be a part of what, you know, kind of what we were doing, that that of everything has been what's been the most critical thing to allowing us to, you know, kind of have that success. And then the individuals that we brought in, the amount of experience they have is just, you know, amazing. The, this, uh, the level of experience. We like to say we've got about 200 people around the globe and they have 5,000 years of experience. Um, and again, that experience you just can't repl replicate. Um, and then we also took a very, you know, spend a little, learn a lot approach to the way we developed the business. We, you know, we, we didn't go out and, you know, raise a lot of equity, raise a lot of capital. So we've, we've taken a very deliberate, you know, kind of a mindful approach to how we wanted to approach creating this company and creating the business. Um, and I think that is, that's paid well because, you know, we weren't spending late nights, you know, sleepless nights wondering, are we going to, you know, get a return on our investment? We could stay just focused on, you know, let's, let's figure out what is the right place for us to play, what are the right practices, the right things we can do for our clients without that overhang of, you know, we have investors that are going to come and, you know, put a horse head in our bed if we don't, <laughs> if we don't deliver. Um, and then finally, I, I, you know, this, the, the fact that there were so many mentors, so many friends, you know, to be honest, so many people I'm, you know, from the PNG alumni community, the current PNGers, uh, friends and family who came to RA to to mentor us, to give it advice, to you know give suggestions. Um, you know, that the the concept of it takes a village to raise a family. You know, it it really does take a village to raise a company. Um, and finding those individuals who are willing to spend their time and 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 reach out and and help us has been just 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 phenomenal. So that that I think would be the ones that I would I would say now. Okay. Well, let me uh, let me twist it a little bit here. Hey, Graham, if you can uh, come in for a second. Um, while you were still in the throes of your P&G career, you, uh, you threw money at Jeff to keep this thing going as we got started. Um, what, how, from your perspective, why did you think this was going to be successful? Uh, Matt, I would say that, um, you know, on top of what Jeff just said, that we've, we've always felt that we have a good product, right? At the end, you can have core values, great people, but you also need a product, right? And we believe that our product, which is basically, you know, understanding what clients need and then finding the people who've done it before and putting those putting that together in a package, which is really a win-win-win. So the client wins because they get a better, a better product from us. The advisors win because we're keeping them busy. And of course, Symphony in the middle wins. So it's always been about the product. Um, and obviously, over the first couple of years, we we learned kind of how to how to generate that product, and we made some mistakes along the way. But always from the beginning, we've been focused on making sure that what the client receives is an excellent product. And so that's why I continue to invest in Jeff in the early days. Okay, so let's go back and talk a little bit about the challenges and some of those twists. Um, what have been, you know, if you look back now after getting to the five-year mark, what 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 would you each consider to be the biggest challenge that we've had to face and overcome? And you can you can start, Graham or Jeff, doesn't matter. Yeah, I, I can start. I, I would say um, the first challenge we had was that, as as I think Jeff mentioned at the beginning, we we started out focus focused on um, FP&A, so forecasting. Um, and that really is just too small a pool to be able to generate a, a, a kind of the size of the company that we wanted. And so the first thing we had to kind of understand is that it, we're not necessarily just selling FP&A. So we were selling 
experience of FP&A, but that market isn't big enough. So we needed to understand how to then move into other practice areas. And so we started to move into accounting, uh, source to pay, et cetera. So I think that that was one of the first things that we had to kind of kind of learn and get over, which is that the FP&A space wasn't big enough. Yeah, I, I, and, and and without a doubt, I think that that would be one. I I think the you know for me, Nat, there would have been a a couple things in in addition. You know, I think the one is you know coming into a business and you know we are great functional experts. You know, we have a lot of expertise, a lot of skills. We've you know have a lot of connections. We know a lot of people, um, but none of us had ever done sales before. And you know, running a successful business, creating something from from nothing, it's it's all about how do you find that client, how do you find that customer, and when you've never done selling uh, business development, you know, I think that was one of the first things that okay, you know, how do we approach that? How do we go do that? And there was a very senior sales leader, Procter and Gamble, who had retired. I reached out to, I'd known him in my days when I was in Simia, and, and I and I recall asking for his advice. You know, what do you suggest I do? And he immediately said, "Go get a real salesperson because you're not that Jeff." And uh, and we laughed, and you know, and I think it was, you know, I think it was very fair and it was very appropriate. So I think that for me was one of those biggest challenges. It continues to be, you know. Again, going back to the Sing 5000 conference I went to, you know, I, I met. David Freeman, he's the the CEO of Freestar, which is the fastest growing company in the U.S. In three years, they grew 36,000 percent. And when I asked him, you know, what's his biggest challenge for his business, he said sales and business development. So, you know, I think no matter what you do when you're a startup company, you you know that's a key and and trying to figure that out and how do you find clients, how do you find the revenue, and then I think just from a personal standpoint, but also watching the company as it grows, develops, is I've never been a CEO. You know, I was a finance leader in my career. So, you know, I've had to recognize that I need to grow my skills. At the same time, the business requires a CEO with more and more skills. And so how do you do that as an individual to, you know, come into something where your leadership, you know, our advisors, all of us need to grow is the business grows and not, you know, and, and recognize that fact. And it's, it's nothing bad with it. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, but, you know, that's the only way a company as it grows and scales can continue as if, if all the individuals, all the leaders in the business step back and look in the mirror and say, you know, how do I take myself to that next level, that next, that, that next thing. Good. Babash, I see you uh, unmuted. What do you, you got, you have a thought on this? Yeah, I think just building on what uh, Jeff was saying is, you know, we are a startup and, um, I think for the majority of the managing partners, this is their first startup. And so we have to cons remember that our uh, DNA is built from a company that was somewhere between 40 and $80 billion in size when we were there. Um, and, and now we're in a company that's closer to zero billion. Obviously one day we'll get there, but not just yet. And so remembering that is important so that we take the best parts of what we know and is built into our sort of logic and way of thinking, but understanding that we can take decisions in different ways and uh, and be faster than we might have been. And so making sure that we don't forget that and keep that in mind because the competitive environment we're in is, is quite brutal. So we need to be able to take the best of what we learned at our time at blue chip companies, which for many of us is P&G, uh, and the fact that we're in a startup now and how to guide that and steer that and uh, make sure we pivot successfully at each point that we need to do that. Good, just for, just let's build on that point for just a second. So um, I think some P former Fortune 1000 players, like all of us were, uh, struggle a bit with entrepreneur entrepreneurial activities and, they, and we struggle with that transition. What's the what's maybe the one or two things that you guys have learned from the transition that you think have been critical for us to be to uh, to see Symphony grow as quickly as it has? Maybe if I can just sort of carry on my thoughts there, the the, the key part here is to make sure that we all believe in the same values as, as uh, Jeff mentioned before. So we behave in the in the right way and consistently, but that we all have the same objective in mind. Um, you know, today we're uh, a company of a few 
managing partners and we need to make sure that that few continue to think in the same way in terms of what the objectives are. When you're working in a larger company, although you may have saw more, the same core values, you may have tens of thousands of different objectives and it's always hard to make sure those align. Uh, so for me, we've got to continue as we grow to make sure that we're all singularly aligned to the right objectives. So when we make our decision, which you, you know, which you always have to do in a, in a case of conflict, that we make it with that objective in mind. And, uh, Graham, I'll, I'll, I'll go, and then if, if you have some something to share as well, I and 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 I'm sure you do because I where I'm going to go is I think probably similar to what you would do is, you know, I know for me personally as I kind of you know left P and G coming and I like to say I moved two blocks west and ten stories higher to uh, to the Chiquita building across the street from P and G the, uh, the 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 headquarters, and uh, but. But look back on my career and said, what were those moments in my career where I felt like an entrepreneur, and 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 really behave that way and acted that way versus you know you you know you're in some of these larger roles where it's very difficult to feel entrepreneurial because you know the, the the company structure and processes weren't designed for that, and so for me I looked back at my time you know I was a decade in Central and Eastern Europe and. And, and, and a lot of that time in, in the Nova Moskos plant or in Central Asia and Almaty, Kazakhstan or in Kiev, Ukraine, and 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 and, and also Nipopotrovsk. I, I ran a business PNG had acquired and looked back to those times and said, what were the things that, yeah, you know, we got a regular paycheck as you know, you're part of PNG, but what were those things you needed to do the way you needed to fact that that or think the way you needed to behave in order to keep those businesses growing and growing fast? And, and for me, you know, that was something that helped me a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, Graham, I know that, you know, you spent all this time in Latin America, you know, I, which you, you probably feel the same. Yeah, I, I would reinforce that, which is, you know, the, the best times in P&G were when you felt entrepreneurial, when you were opening a new market, launching a new brand, launching a new process. Uh, those were the most fun times when you were actually creating something. And so, that's the piece that we've tried to bring over to Symphony, which is we're all part of you know one team, and we're all trying to create create the company, um, you know, using our own hands. And it's more risky because, like Jeff said, you don't get a regular paycheck um, as you would in a in a large multinational, but you are actually getting that entrepreneurial uh, kick uh, every day. Yeah. So 2019 is the year that uh, Symphony went global. As I mentioned, we're now in Panama and in Singapore and in Dubai, and we're looking at other places uh, and have plans to open additional offices. Why go global? What was, uh, what was the reason for going global? Why is that so important? Do you, do you want me to go first? Yeah, sure. do you want to go first? I, I would say there are two reasons. One is because our clients asked us, um, and so you know you have to follow the money. Um, that's again part of being entrepreneurial. Um, so most of our most of our clients have been multinationals, and so they've consistently given us feedback that they would like to do more work with us if we had a global footprint. Um, so that was really the business reason, and the other one is really from day one when we wrote the napkin, uh, whatever that was, ten years ago. Um, Jeff and I wanted this to be a global company. We felt that, um, you know, that we'd done global projects in PNG and that we wanted to build a global company. Uh, and obviously, it takes time to do that. But based off of the feedback from our clients, we decided that 2019 was the year to make that happen. Anything to add, Jeff? No, I, I, I think that's, you know, dead on. I, you know, I, we, we, we started this with a plan to, you know, we wanted it to be global. It was our, you know, kind of ingoing kind of the vision of where we would want this to be eventually. Um, in fact, it's probably, this is, is earlier than we, we probably would have anticipated or, you know, at least in the original business plans. Uh, but it was something we definitely wanted to do and, and, and we could do it because of, you know, the roles that, you know, Graham has had or, or, uh, uh, or I have had, or, you know, many of the partners, Bob Ash, yourself, Matt, you know, the types of roles we've had where, you know, we had those, that global outreach and, and the opportunity to travel and, and work abroad, again, thanks to, to, to PNG and 
in, you know, in this network. So, well, how do you go global? I mean, if you're sitting there and you're on top of a business and you're growing a uh, a business and you're wherever you might be, and you decide that that's part of what you need to be, you need to be in these other markets. How do you do that? What's the process? How do how did you, how do you go global? I think it'd be great to be able to describe a. A sort of a, a, a classic PNG one pager sort of describes the the steps that you do. But as in a in many startups, you know, we, we've got the napkins as we've sort of referred to. We've got the lunches as well. And so in our case for Asia, Jeff was uh, uh, meeting with me for a lunch where he was sort of uh, selling me on Symphony and how it could help the company I was with at at the time. And the discussion quickly sort of turned into, well, I think actually you need help in in Asia to grow there because that's obviously going to be a big market for you and then what we just discussed about global presence and then we sort of turned that discussion okay well how do you how can you help us Pat and so I connected Symphony to some people I knew that were in Singapore we sort of said that would be a good place to start and and then from that and with me then being um, uh, freed up from my previous work I could go more full-time into this and so that discussion sort of led us to how we developed Asia and, uh, and I'll let sort of Jeff cover maybe some of how we've how we've connected for some of the other offices. Yeah, and you know, I and Graham, you 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 can share some of the LA stories as well. And you know, we we just opened in Middle East Africa as well and Dubai. And I I think the the key thing is as we started up our North America business and recognized we're a startup, we need to be entrepreneurial. I think it's that same type of mindset as we look to new regions, as we look to new cities or new countries, is is maintaining that. Hey, what we're what we're bringing to you, and you know, you know, Bob, you said it very well. Is you know, it's it's that entrepreneurial spirit that really you need to kind of continue to generate because you know we we in all the conversations we have with people, it's not. Hey, we're bringing you something that's you know 170 years old and you know has the billion dollar brands. We're bringing to you something that you know has proven to be successful. We feel we have a model that's worked quite well in North America, but as we bring it abroad, we need to prove that again and again and again. Again, we're going to start with something that's you know proven uh, to some extent, but you know how do you then take that and you know get people excited and and you know ready to, to kind of share that same vision, the same um, future. And so, you know, I think, you know, between myself and, and, and Graham and Bob and um, Yasser and, you know, Pierre and Jet and all the new partners who have come in, you know, all of us have kind of had that same share of, hey, you know, we, we like what we're doing. We want to continue to work together. We've, we've enjoyed doing what we're doing so far. And it's, you know, kind of just continuing that, but also recognizing you know, that entrepreneurial spirit is what helps kind of that collective connective tissue and, you know, keeps this moving and moving forward. I don't know, Graham, anything else you'd add? Yeah, I mean, the, the only thing I would add is that, you know, what we've done is just talk to a lot of people to understand, you know, is there a match? Um, and if there isn't a match, that's not a bad thing. It just might mean that people have different objectives in life, right? Um, but so we've we've really leveraged the kind of the PNG network, our network, to find people that you know want to join us and are a good fit for us. Um, so you know the PNG alumni has helped us a lot. What's the what's been the biggest challenge? Uh, there's not enough time in the day and not enough days in the week. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think that there's a couple of challenges that, you know, I think the, the one and, you know, Graham, I think you can attest to it, Bob, you know, we just had, you know, we were just in Europe and having some conversations with, you know, finding new partners for our European operations. It's, it's finding people who want to live the risk of being an entrepreneur as they lead the safety of a corporate situation. Um, multiple times we've had conversations and, and this also happens in the North America business as well. It's, it's not just, you know, us trying to go global, it's also just trying to do the work we're doing uh, within the US or in North America is, you know, finding people who say, I'm I'm okay to lose that, that safety net. I'm okay to lose that umbrella that's, you know, kind of helped me, nurtured me, grew me, developed my career um, and go do something that's very entrepreneurial and something very different. So I think that is a challenge. Um, 
you know, not one that we've, you know, we've managed, I think, from, you know, the way that we've articulated the, the business model, I think, in the way that we've, you know, kind of been very open and very transparent with, with, with people. I think that has helped us to kind of overcome that. Um, and then I think the other one is just, how do you maintain your base business as you start growing globally? You know, we've had a very good, successful North America business. Well, now as we go global, do we run a risk and run a chance of distracting ourselves from that core base, losing the base? And then, you know, we may have a great global business, but then we lose, you know, kind of the starting point. And so, you know, that's, that is a challenge for us as we think about this global expansion. Of, you know, how do we make sure that we're mindful of, you know, we need to be ready. We need to be prepared to, yes, to grow globally, to support and sustain it, but at the same time, not lose, you know, kind of what, what we've built already. Maybe I can just add a, a point to what Jeff was saying at the beginning there. The difficult challenge, I think, can be for people who are in, in, in big corporations, and obviously we're all connected through P&G, is that there's a, sometimes a misconception that you can leave a big corporation and that your Rolodex will make you into an entrepreneur. And that clearly is not the case. And I, I was very lucky that actually I got that advice many years ago from uh, Deepak Gupta, who actually runs the PNG alumni in, in India and Asia. And he said, don't be confused between uh, what your business card says and who you are. Uh, and when you go into the entrepreneurial space, your Rolodex will help you to get some phone calls and coffees for the first six months. But after that, you really need to have something uh, in place uh, and be an entrepreneur. And so the advice, I think, for people who are looking to set up businesses coming out of bigger organizations is to be conscious of that and to make sure they've really thought through uh, a plan and, and, and all the difficulties that you will face going out of a, a relatively sort of comfortable existence into something that is a bit more uh, at the coal face. Mm -hmm. Let's tease that out a little bit. Um, so you 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 got together. We, you decided that it would be a good idea to open an office in Singapore. You have an event. You invite a lot of people. Then what happens? What was it like the next day? What's the what? And then what? And what did you do to fill that time? Or was give us a sense. Was it was it lonely once the once the party was over and you realized you had to go build a business or was it exciting? Tell us a little bit about that experience. I think it's a great question. So I think, you know, if we take the opening as a sort of day zero, what's been really great and Graham was pivotal for us is that there's actually um, a methodology that we've developed at Symphony, which is sort of the 90 days before that, a minus three months. And so it, it basically will help you to, um, uh, not spoon feed you, but give you those, okay, you know, these are the sort of things you've got to get going. Simple things from, is the company incorporated in the right way in the country you're going to operate in? Uh, have you got the bank account set up? Have you got the right legal advice? Have you got contracts ready to go? And in our case, um, because we had such an energy going into it and the network that Pierre and Jet have as well as my own in, in Asia, we were already able to hire advisors. So think of it as consultants that are ready to go at should we have business. And we already had leads into um, clients that were ready to go with us as well. So having the sort of backbone of Symphony behind us was essential to make sure that we had a successful sort of startup, the event being a sort of kickoff point to where we're saying, that, okay, we're here now and really ready to get bigger. And it really hasn't stopped from that. I, I don't think there's a moment where we're concerned about what do we do next or how are we going to do this? It's generally what, uh, uh, Graham said is we just wish we had more time because there's so many opportunities, uh, many driven by the PNG alumni uh, at this stage. And, you know, how do we make sure we capture that? So, at, you know, we're four to five months in as a Singapore and Asian office. We're already at the stage where we're looking to uh, open operations in some format in the Philippines. Uh, we're looking at China as well. So at least at this stage, you know, sort of in the first 180 days, it's very much a growth phase and a high energy phase. Um, and uh, yeah, I would and I'd say that the, the, the benefit has been that because Jeff and Graham have sort of been through a little bit of how to start up, but first in North America, uh, then in Latin America, all the new affiliates as such have the benefit of that uh, experience. I don't know if you want to add to that, Graham. Um, 
No, the, the thing that I would say um, from opening Latin America is, because um, I did that in, in January, January the 1st, <laughs> um, is that you really do feel that you're an entrepreneur. Things happen because you, you make them happen, right? Um, and so really you, you, you sit at your desk and you just start, right? And there's a long list of things that need to happen. Like, like Bob said, you have to open the bank account, you have to get the legal entity open, you have to start meeting with clients, et cetera, et cetera. And you just start doing it and, and then things start to happen. If that, that's the fun part. And it's great, by the way, it's great for, for all of us then to see that process being replicated in Singapore, hopefully in the future in, in Philippines and in Dubai, et cetera. Well, you guys have all, I mean, you, the, uh, the excitement that you have is, is I think, comes through. Uh, and we've painted a pretty positive picture of what this process is like. What, what, are some, what have been some of the downsides? What, are, what, have, what have been some of the disappointments that uh, you've run into trying to build this business? You want me to start, guys? <laughs> I, I, I was there the sure. first two years when we had plenty of disappointments. <laughs> you know, I, we, again, we were blessed with a lot of amazing mentors, some great people who helped us early on. And, and I recall there was a couple of the NY partners who were just, were just wonderful, just so nice, to us, so kind to us. And I remember them telling us, hey, Jeff, this is going to take three to five years. So are you ready for that? And, uh, and of course, naively, you kind of, oh, yeah, 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 sure. It'll take us three to five years. And, it literally took us three years. So we, it, it was, luckily, it wasn't on the far end. It was on the shorter end of that number. But in the first two years, there were definitely moments where you're kind of like, we really don't know what we're doing, and and do we want to continue? And you know, luckily, you know, we had a good sounding board where we would step back and objectively look at how we're doing. And you know, so I, you know, I think that was one of them. Is you know, kind of. Time, I think, works in two ways. Do I have enough of it today? But also, am I waiting long enough for the patience and perseverance to to see it to the end? While at the same time, I think the other thing is being able to pivot and learn very quickly of what's not working and let me go search out what will work. You know, again, Graham mentioned it early on, you know, our original ongoing plan was we were going to be a finance transformation consulting firm. And in the first week, we realized nobody wanted that at that moment. We actually, you know, do a really good job at, at that type of work now. And we quickly realized, hey, with all the experience we have, we can do other things as well. And so, you know, understanding those critical moments when you do need to pivot, you may need to bring in new things that you hadn't thought of in the beginning um, that, that help you. And then, you know, I think just the other piece is managing a large, diverse organization. And, you know, how do you get the partners all wanting to go in the same direction, do the same thing, be excited about it, you know, not fight about things, uh, you know, and, you know, celebrate the moment, have fun. One of our core values is fun and, and recognizing that, you know, yeah, fun may be one of our core values, but not every day is fun. You know, there's, there's painful, difficult conversations that need to be had. Um, and, and, and as long as you continue to go back to, hey, you know, we're on a journey, we know it's a journey, there's going to be highs, there's going to be lows, um, but, but we're going to recognize those fun moments, those celebratory moments, um, and, you know, just recognize that that's a fact of, of how this works. But, you know, I think just that finding the right partners, you know, and we've had people come and we've had people go is, you know, is, is, is one of the critical enablers to what we're doing, but also one of the biggest challenges. And, and, and can be obstacles. Oh, Graham, Bob. The, the, the thing I would add or kind of reinforce that Jeff just said is part of our culture is that, you know, we do expect things, we don't expect everything to work. So we do expect some things not to work. But, you know, you learn more from when something doesn't work than when something does work. And so we always, you know, use, use that as an opportunity to learn and pivot, as Jeff said. Um, so yeah, there's been some, let's say, low moments, but we've always learned from them and we've always come back stronger. And I, I would just add to that is, you know, just in any business, there's always going to be uh, lows and highs. And in those low moments is, is not to take it personally uh, and be able to keep your head cool and, and to know that you've got a network of uh, friends around the world and 
and in, in our case in Symphony, a growing network of people within Symphony, but also outside, as we've all sort of mentioned many times, sort of the network and the mentors and uh, and people that are like, for instance, on this call today. So to just make sure that you take a rational approach to it, and then as, as um, Jeff said, you can pivot that into something even more positive. All right. Well, we've uh, we've been talking now for about uh, 25 minutes. Uh, let's uh, put a pin in this and then let uh, let Amir get us some questions. So before we do that, though, uh, maybe you can give us a quick wrap, Jeff. What's next for Symphony? Where 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 are they? Where's this company headed going forward? What's the next big thing? I mean, we you know the first thing really is we just want to make sure we're continuing to improve and expand upon the client work that we're doing already and you know deliver it with success leverage our experienced advisors and you know just really deliver that outstanding quality you know literally utilizing our experienced advisors i think that's critical you know the next is how do we maintain our north america business you know we need to keep it growing it is our core it is our base while at the same time we open offices throughout the us whether you know in the us in canada you know, Europe is a critical place for us. I was just there, Bob and I, last week in conversations on where do we open and how do we open Europe up. Um, Central and Eastern Europe is critical to us. And then within the regions that already exist, both LA or LA, Asia, and MIA, it's looking at, okay, when do we open and how do we open, a, a, you know, Costa Rica or Brazil or China or Philippines, Egypt or Saudi. But, you know, continue to, you know, make sure that base is strong and, you know, grow from that. Um, and again, stay close to our clients because at the end of the day, where they want us to be is where we will be going. Because um, that's, you know, the end of the end of the day, the business development is what, you know, keeps this this business uh, moving forward and, and and growing. And then I think just the final piece is, you know, we we are acquisitive. We've we've done a deal last year where we we brought in a another company was very successful for, for both. Uh, the owners of that company and ourselves. So, you know, we'll continue to explore ways to acquire, ways to merge, to, to, to grow this business as well. Great. I see uh, Amir says we've got some questions in the queue. So, Amir, I'm going to turn it back to you and uh, and uh, let's see what uh, what's on the minds of the people who are listening in. Super. Thank you so much again, uh, gentlemen, for sharing your perspective and, and congratulations uh, on, on your success. Uh, we've had, we have a few questions that have come in. Let's just uh, start with how long have you guys been in existence? I think that the answer to that is, I believe uh, you, you started in 2014. Uh, but the question, the second part of the question is, what was your first success? What do you consider to be your first success? Um, well, actually, let me take that that first. When did we start? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> backwards just real quick, and then and then and Bob and or Graham think about the first success while I do that. Um, the so we actually started this the company the thinking of the company back in two thousand and nine. Um, we actually were uh, on a balcony in Panama and we pulled out a napkin. It was late at night and. Uh, we pulled out a napkin and wrote a business plan, and that was in 2009. And and the three founding partners were were all at PNG, so we did nothing with it, of course. And then in 2011, we took the napkin and really framed out more of a business plan because you know even though people talk about having a, a a napkin, you know, start they probably then put a little bit of pen to paper to to frame out really what you want to do. So we we created a bit more expansive business plan. Of course, we were all three at PNG, so we did nothing with that. And only in 2014 did we actually spend the summer, you know, hiring a marketing agency, naming the company, branding the company, really starting up the company. So almost five years after we kind of pulled the napkin out and the napkin is still in corporate archives if anyone wants to ever see it. Um, and, and that was when the company was really started. Um, and first success, I, Graham, did you think of one while, while I was rambling a bit? But Oh, I think I know some. Okay. Now, what would you what would you say? Well, I was going to say the the first whale, uh, as we like to call it. We were, I think, I forget the book was that uh, when yeah. you had idle time, and uh, again through a good P and G alumni connection, we got invited to do uh, some cost analysis work for uh, for a company that I can't name or won't name, and uh, all of a sudden we went from. I would say uh, going from door to door with our little bucket to, hey, wait a minute, we can land a 
a fairly substantial project and we can deliver that project. And we learned how, I think we learned pretty quickly what the process was to get a larger consulting project sort of through the pipe and to the client in a successful way. And that really helped us, I think, from a confidence standpoint. I don't know if you'd agree with that, Jeff, but I think it did. I, I like that. Graham, were you gonna say something? Yeah, I was gonna say, I think the first success was was kind of when we realized that the best clients for us would actually be multinationals and not smaller companies, because um, that allowed us to focus and then that's the process that Matt just described. Super, well, thank you so much for that. I wanna just make sure that I get as many of these questions in. So the other question that I wanna to present to you is, can you tell us about a time that you had to pivot? What was the problem? How did you work it through? And how did you pivot? So let, let, let me start this and then Graham, you, you probably have some thoughts in, in that. So literally day one of Symphony, I went to a conference and uh, it was a conference on shared services. And, you know, as we talked earlier, we were we were focused on finance transformation. So I went to this shared services conference to talk about finance transformation. And so I arrived and, you know, I show up and everybody at this conference wanted to talk to me about shared services. And when I would bring up finance and finance transformation, they, no, 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 I want to talk about shared services because P&G had done so much with shared services over, you know, the, the past two to three, you know, two and a half decades. And so within probably the first two days of Symphony's existence, we, myself and, and one of my original power partners was with me, we said, hey, we do shared services too. So already in the first two to three days of Symphony, we pivoted. And so I, you know, I think that was the first of them. And then, you know, I don't know, Nat or, or Graham, if there were others that you know, you think of, but from that, we just added more and more practices based upon, we quickly delinked ourselves from saying, we only do finance transformation. We really are just people who have a lot of experience and we can share that with clients regardless of, you know, kind of what that practice may look like just based on the experiences we've, we've, we've had. Yeah, and the, the other example would be opening the, uh, the international offices, um, like I said earlier, that was really based off of client feedback. We knew that we were losing work because the clients were telling us they were not giving us the work. Uh, and so we quickly just took the decision that, you know, what's stopping us from opening the international office is nothing. So, so we set off and did that. Yeah, I, I'd back up with one too that I think is important is, uh, and I think this is, this is a watchword for many, uh, uh, alumni from large corporates is uh, like a moth to the flame. You can get excited about startups. And <laughs> we tried to engage in the startup community. And uh, I, I mean, I just make this point. Uh, it's wonderful stuff. It's very neat, but it's a hobby. It's not a money making proposition. Uh, and our role as experience is uh, they're going to milk you for what you know, but it's not a it's not a lucrative space, but it's very easy to be invited into that space and you think you're making forward progress. Uh, but don't don't be uh, don't be uh, uh, confused. It's not a lucrative space uh, for what we do. Um, and that would lead to the other piece, which is really beginning to understand how powerful an experience based consulting model uh, could be. So building on what uh, Jeff and Graham said. Very good. Uh, the next question is about the employment agreement that you have with the executive uh, advisors. Is it a full-time employment type of situation? Are they independent contractors or some other arrangement? Graham, do you want to oh. take that or you want me? No, I can, I can answer that. So our model is that um, most of our advisors are independent contractors. Um, that gives flexibility on both sides flexibility for for symphony as a company and also flexibility for the advisors um, and so far that has worked in pretty much all cases there's a couple of exceptions but that's the model we've chosen and and we're also reimplying that in the in the expansion to the other geographies that's a model that that is kind of very valid today okay 
Very cool, thank you. And uh, we've have we have time for just a couple more questions. Uh, questions come in. How do you how did you choose the name uh, Symphony? Because uh, uh, and and the comment that was made is usually consulting firms start with a a name that is well positioned and, and recognized. So how did you guys come up with Symphony? So as I like to joke, I it's what happens when a couple of finance guys get in a room and try to name a company. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, it actually it actually means synchronized financials, um, and it's where it kind of came from. And we kind of liked it because it you know a symphony and putting together different organizations and different work. And so we did like the way it kind of the word played. Uh, and and now actually in hindsight, having you know said that, you know the the nice thing about the name is it's easy to own. Uh, there's no other symphonies out there. I think there's two others. One's a Long Island jazz band that's defunct, and these other is a, a uh, um, I think a comic strip character. And so it's an easy name to own. But yeah, it just came from Synchronized Financials, and we like the name, and it stuck with it. And the advisors came from the fact we, you know, I think consulting has had a bad rap, um, and 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 a little bit of a bad connotation, and so we didn't want to be you know, kind of the consulting, we wanted to go more with something where it was, you know, we're, we're your trusted advisor, we're the people you can call and get advice and suggestions and um, somebody you'd want to call. Uh, and uh, so we went with that instead of, you know, traditional consulting. Very good. And uh, on that note, we're going to conclude the Q&A uh, session. Uh, thank our panelists uh, and congratulations on your success. And, and we really appreciate you sharing uh, your perspective uh, with the P&G uh, alumni. And with that, I'd like to, uh, again, thank everybody for joining us. Uh, this is Amir Ganad, your host. I'd like to thank you and wish you a great week and much success and fulfillment going forward. Thanks, Thanks Amir. Thanks very much, Amir. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Max. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Thank you.